Hello, everyone. I'm frequently humbled and touched, motivated and encouraged when people contact me by email or texting or commenting or they greet me on the street and tell me that my work has been transformative for them. If this has been the case for you, and also if you want to share it with other people, please consider supporting my work by joining my Patreon community. All financial support goes to the Verveke Foundation, where my team and I are diligently working to create the science, the practices, the teaching, and the communities. If you want to participate in my work, and many of you ask me that, how can I participate? How can I get involved? Then this is the way to do it. The Verveke Foundation is something that I'm creating with other people, and I'm trying to create something as virtuously as I possibly can. No grifting, no making, setting myself up as a guru. I want to try and make something really work so that people can support, participate, and find community by joining my Patreon. I hope you consider that this is a way in which you can make a difference and matter. Please consider joining my Patreon community at the link below. Thank you so very much for your time and attention. Welcome everyone to another Voices with Verveke. I'm excited to have Peter Zablinski on again. Uh, this is his second time. Last time he was here, we explored the interrelationships uh, between what was happening in psychotherapy and some of uh, my work, and I found it really interesting and powerful. I was excited to hear, we were talking just before we turned on everything, I was excited to hear that uh, Peter has another case to bring to us, and again, um, I'm going to allow him to present that, and then we'll enter into how does it interact with some of my work. Uh, uh, Peter suggested there might be some important connections between what's being disclosed in this case study and uh, Dialogos and, and therefore mental health. And so I'm really looking forward to this. So welcome again, Peter. Could you just reintroduce yourself again briefly? Sure. So I work uh, in Canada as a psychiatrist. And uh, I mostly focus on private practice where um, I get to uh, do my dream job, you know. Um, and I'm really blessed because I don't think everybody ends up in their dream job. But I can honestly say that I am there. Um, I found, I found it a bit difficult for me to kind of in, in find my way uh, or find where I fit within mainstream psychiatry, uh, within the hospital system. And so, you know, during, during my training, I found myself particularly attracted to psychotherapy because this is where I found perhaps that I could bring a little bit more creativity or a little bit more of my own authentic, um, aspects of myself to the work. Uh, and I got nothing against science and I've got nothing against more of the institutionalized psychiatry, which I think offers a lot of important value to people and to society. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, um, I found myself drawn to do more psychotherapy where I had more independence. And sure enough, when I graduated about 10 years ago now, I've been doing full-time private practice and seeing individuals and couples in psychotherapy. And I do a few other odds and ends. But it's been uh, really fulfilling because, you know, um, I was the guy who growing up, you know, I'd go to a party and I'd kind of find one person and we'd get into the corner and just have a nice, like more connected, more deeper conversation. Uh, you know, I always enjoyed kind of these kinds of philosophical or deeper conversations. And uh, uh, what I was thrilled, I think, about discovering psychotherapy is that here's a place where, uh, you know, a vocation where I can be paid uh, quite generously for doing what I really enjoy. And sure enough, it seems to be healing. So um, I I've always found that quite fascinating. Um, and I suppose that's, that's that's a big part of what we're going to be exploring today, because as, as I've been following you and following your work, I've found that you've uh, provided a lot of the language for what I've uh, intuitively felt is going on. And a lot of the, the mainstream scientific paradigm or mainstream psychological paradigm didn't seem to offer me um, something that was sort of uh, uh, congruent with what I experienced in my in my be better sessions sessions that felt very healing for my patients and sure enough i felt a bit healed myself and it was a little mm. bit transgressive it's like well wait a minute am i supposed to be feeling better am i supposed to be feeling like my own personal development is tied into this patient's therapy how come i get to bill the government for this i was almost like 
feeling like this is too good to be true. Um, so, so again, that's another way of saying why this is my you know dream job. So there's a little bit about me and uh, uh, a bit more about how come I, I feel like your work has been so uh, meaningful and so so exciting for me to follow. And by the way, I just want to say uh, I've been um, watching uh, after Socrates, and I just got through episodes uh, ten A and B, and uh, I just want to congratulate you. Like I thought there was some really powerful moments that you captured there, and uh, I'm just really thrilled to be uh, to be watching you, and really excited to see what's coming next. Well, thank you, <clears throat> and I owe a lot also to uh, Chris Master Pietro and Guy Sen Sengstock and Taylor Barrett. Uh, they really made that uh, those episodes sing. Uh, yeah. They will be also back at. Uh, later episodes you are coming up soon uh, uh there's a series within the series where uh, uh, chris and i uh talk about socrates and kierkegaard uh dialogically um so looking forward oh, to that um you said that you the uh, last time it was you know quite it, interesting isn't quite the word it, it bordered on being thrilling when you were sort of opening up like uh, this sort of shared mystical experience you'd had with a with a patient and you've got another case you want to uh, bring forward and and then uh, you and I will enter into a, a dialogue about it. Uh, so please, why don't you uh, move into that? Let me start by just really acknowledging and thanking my patients. Um, some of the feedback that I received from our previous video and from that conversation was that there was a bit uh, focus on me, perhaps too much focus on me. It was a shared experience is how I framed it. And yet, um, I, I, I worry, or some of the people who, who viewed it worried that there was a little bit too much um, focus on me. And this was a, a sacred story, you might say, uh, a really vulnerable, uh, horrific uh, story of trauma that I shared about a patient. And if me sharing my patient's story here comes across as exploitative, or if it's a, you know, a matter of me joining John Verveke on Voices and getting clicks and getting likes, that is not what this is about. And I'd be really worried if that were the case. Really what I hope to, to use this as is a forum to put forward these stories as beautiful as possible so that the patients who have agreed and given me consent and in fact have collaborated with me to produce the story and to bring it here today, that, they, that, that their story will give them more meaning. Their experiences will, will possibly be able to put out into the world so that others can learn and so mm -hmm. that others can benefit from it. So I really just wanna start with a deep gratitude for all my patients. For everything that they've been through because my goal is not to use that for my own betterment but for if, if hopefully this doesn't sound grandiose or naive but for the betterment of all or perhaps so that you and i can explore how we can you know make things better in the mental health system or you know for people out there in general who are dealing with the mental or with the uh, meaning crisis well said thank you for saying that very well said so today i'll be telling you about a story um about david and David is a uh, white male who uh, is raised in Canada, about my age, um, and who uh, is currently married. He's, he has a child, um, and he works for the government. And um, we've been in, working in psychotherapy weekly for not quite 10 years, but perhaps eight. And again, working as a psychiatrist in Canada, just want to appreciate that I've had the privilege of engaging these long form conversations with people over many years mm -hmm. about the deepest, darkest uh, details of their life. So again, so much appreciation for the position that I'm in and the system that, that pays me to, to do this amazing work. Um, so we've been going for eight years. And um, initially he started off as a very disconnected person, very disconnected from himself, from the world, from relationships. And uh, what I wanna tell you about is uh, so the first half of our conversation, I'm imagining I'll be giving you more or less sort of a background on him. Yeah, and, please, yeah. please. And then as we go, I'm going to tell you about a very powerful experience that unfolded over several months within the last one year, where we had a very powerful connection and his healing seemed to be intertwined with my personal development, or like I want to call it the development of my personal, my, my moral integrity, actually. And the simultaneity or the sort of the resonance between those two processes made it feel like one process. Mm. So uh, that to me is, is, is the point that I really want your help to, to, uh, to draw out. If, if, if you can help me with that in the second half of our conversation. Of course. So, as I said, uh, my age <clears throat> came to me about eight years ago. And um, interestingly enough, um, he, he presented 
um, or a, a colleague referred him for CBT, which, you know, uh, if I can just make a quick cheap joke at the expense of CBT, uh, often <laughs> CBT is, is conducted for 12 or 18 sessions or something like that. And initially that was my, my uh, intent. Uh, but as it turns out, that was not at all the modality that would have been appropriate for him. And uh, sessions and sessions started going by, and I realized we're not doing CBT. Mm -hmm. um, the first first indications that I got that he's somebody who needs something more, something deeper, was uh, just how how um, uh, how pleasant and wonderful it was to sit in the room with him. He, he'd kind of float into the room and kind of make himself uh, settled in the couch and check in with me so sincerely. But like it was a bit disarming because he'd be like, "How are you, Doc?" And I'm like, "Wait a minute, aren't I supposed to be the one who's asking you how you're feeling?" But he he was asking it, and it seemed like it was so important to him that I'd be okay. And I almost felt a little bit of a discomfort with how comfortable he was making me feel. There was something odd about that, and it turned out that there was lots to explore there. And as he told me about his early life, like there was lots. Uh, I mean, some of this stuff it feels like you can't make up. So mm -hmm. let me get into some of that. He grew up um, in a Christian family, no longer identifies as Christian. Uh, his father had this sort of simmering anger, and occasionally it would blow up. Um, his father one time had a, a suicidal crisis, and he, uh, uh, David recalls his father raging through the house and threatening to find a gun, which apparently was in the house somewhere, and commit suicide with it. So he remembers being like, really terrified about setting his father off or putting any sort of pressure on him, making his needs known whatsoever. Um, uh, his father also had this tendency to download beliefs onto him and tell him, this is the way it's going to be. This is what I want you to think. So he had this very sort of like uh, the, a lot of incentives to kind of in involute and manage his uh, emotions and manage, manage his um, stress. Mm -hmm. And he learned how to do so in, in really interesting ways. He did this thing called cocooning that he calls cocooning, where he'd sit cross-legged over a vent in his room and put a blanket over his body. And um and he'd basically sit there until uh, he was kind of numb out or he'd be out of touch with his body or out of touch with his stress. Wow. I don't know if that was meditation or if that was some sort of um, effective physiological control or if that was really just the beginning of some severe dissociation or dissociative tendencies that he uh, learned early on and practiced uh, thoroughly from an early age. The other thing um, to say about his early, early years uh, oh, I should also mention, yeah, his sister had a severe anxiety disorder. So he watched his parents dealing with her being hospitalized a couple times. So again, his MO in his youth was, I'm not going to make my needs known. I'm not going to have needs. I don't want to put anything more on my parents more than they already have on their plate. Right, right. And then there's his uh, childhood best friend, Richard. And I, I'm using uh, pseudonyms to disguise the identity of my patients, of course. Sure. Um so Richard was uh, uh, a young man, and they would they would um, or, or boy I suppose when they were childhood best friends, and they'd lie on a hilltop and watch the clouds pass by and talk about their conception of the world and dream into their future together, and uh, they came up with some pretty odd ideas. Together they were they they wove together this understanding that that humans are really just machines. Uh, we're just we're just wet robots, more or less driven by selfish genes. You know, and we're just sort of making our way around the world, exploiting each other, pushing each other around the social domain. Um, you know, if you've got part and if you've got physics that are kind of deterministic particles pushing each other around, well, the social world is is really just an analogy of that, where people are just deterministically putting force on each other, manipulating each other using contrivances and justifications, as Greg Henriquez would say, using justification systems. Right. Um, and and, there, and then you have institutions, uh, the educational system, for example, and this is no better. This is, uh, this is woven from the same um, corrupted fabric, according to David and Richard, that, th that there's nothing but human uh, power and selfishness at play. So all these institutions are corrupt. The whole world is just a place where people are just trying to get stuff out of each other before their short time on this world is snuffed out. And so there you have it. Right. Quite a nihilistic viewpoint of what the world is. Um, and uh, so finally, what they cooked up was a, was a plan for Richard to murder David. Oh. Now, it turns out that Richard is a psychopath, and he grew up to, to be, I think we, we had this confirmed. Uh, but essentially, he, uh, they would torture each other. 
but the way that I would frame it is that it seemed that Richard was usually the one who was more in the position of inflicting pain upon uh, David. And again, D David practiced dissociation. He would he, they would cut each other, they would choke each other, things like this. And he he was he had a remarkable capacity to not feel any pain. Um, the plan was for Richard to murder David. And the two, the two of them kind of um, envisioned this as the fulfillment of their greatest potential. Richard would be the embodiment of the cosmic force of destruction. And David would be the embodiment of the cosmic force of creation. And of course, destruction would win over creation. And as Richard murdered David, that would be the prelude to a, to a further uh, series of murders. Uh, the plan was for Richard to essentially become a serial killer. Wow. So not the usual uh, yeah. childhood dreams that, that the two yeah. uh, shared. <laughs> oh, very disturbing. Very disturbing, you know, um, but so interesting, too, because when I when I hear about his conception of reality, I think there's a lot of people who actually go around with a similar idea that 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 yeah. it's mostly determinism that's going on and that any consciousness that we have is like an epiphenomenon and that our institutions are corrupt. And in fact, I hope that in our second half of our conversation, we'll talk a little bit about I don't want to go so far as to say that our that the, the institution of mental health is corrupt, but like this is a bit of a sneak preview because what I'm hoping to talk about is how there is something about our mental health system that potentially blocks out or brackets out the, the possibility for doctor and patient to connect in a, in a deeply connecting manner. Right. Like, like I wonder if the conditions for DU logos are positively, uh, uh, you know, if, if uh, the mental health system might create conditions that are hostile to DU right. logos. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, yeah. it's a thought. Anyway, so, um, well, so the day that Richard sent an MSN message to David that I'm going to commit, or I'm going to come over and, and murder you now, uh, this is when David had his first panic attack. He, um, his parents noticed that. Uh, they ended up calling the authorities. Richard was taken away. And that was essentially the last they really exchanged words. Oh. Um, so his best friend was sort of whisked out of his life. Um, his parents and he never really talked about it further. He was close with Richard's family, but they never talked about it further. It, it just sort of like a, there was a hard cutoff there. Mm. Um, and he was sent to counseling and he was told that you're not okay and you need to talk about this. <laughs> um, but he really felt like parents uh, and adults in his life did not understand him. And this sort of cemented the, the belief in his mind that I don't go to, I don't go to people for emotional nurturance. Uh, adults don't understand me. Uh, I need to figure things out for myself and keep my needs to myself right um as another example of this he he had a meeting with the superintendent around this time who informed him that richard was actually going to be reintegrated back into the school system where david was attending david attempted to explain how he was convinced that he'd be murdered if this was were the case superintendent said it's out of my hands you know the, the decision's been made so <laughs> so there you go so richard ends up going back to the same school as david and you know what, they, they, they kept their distance from each other and sort of spotted each other from across the schoolyard, but their friendship never resumed. And eventually you know, Richard was, was uh, as far as we can tell, in a, in a, uh, in a uh, uh, ended up in, in the legal system um, shortly thereafter. Um, where did it take you from here? So let me tell you about what our initial sessions were uh, further with myself and David. Mm -hmm. So he first, uh, as I was telling you, was uh, this incredibly like kind, courteous, polite, almost to 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 the nth degree, and I kind of didn't know how, how to how to how to deal with that. But over time, he started actually disclosing a little bit more as a, as a, some of the details of his childhood that I, that I'm telling you now. That it took it took a, a couple of years before many of these details started coming out, uh, which essentially means I think that he was developing slowly developing comfort with putting his needs on me or you know, allowing my feathers to be ruffled. So first his priority was to look after my comfort at all costs, but then he was allowing himself to experiment a little bit more with, with self-revelation, right? Right, right. <clears throat> Any questions so far? So far this is uh, enthralling, <laughs> keep going. Yeah, good. So, um, all right. Oh, uh, the other thing I should mention is that he, uh, I don't want to go back and forth in time too much, but uh, work was always a challenge for him. As you can imagine, he struggled with authority figures. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And having ambiguous expectations at work was uh, very, very stressful for him. 
So he worked in the school system at, at, uh, at one point, uh, but he much preferred working um, for a grocery store where his, the, his job was much more algorithmic and he knew exactly what he needed to do to, to do his job well. But working in the school system, he ended up actually working with troubled kids who some of their parents were abusive. He needed to be involved with CFS. And as I was mentioning to you, he had deep suspicions about any system, any institution. Right. So CFS, Child and Family Services, he felt, or what he saw, uh, according to his experience, is that this was a bunch of uh, white uh, you know, teachers or school staff who would be calling um, these, these, these social workers. And the children, mostly indigenous, would be um, taken out of a chaotic home environment and placed into another chaotic you know, right. foster care environment where, where um, according to David, it seemed like uh, much of the abuse just continued or took on another form. Yeah. So he felt like he was involved in a in a in a work um, a, a workplace. Um, you know, his workplace expectations were essentially impossible to uh, to satisfy. So he found that work exceedingly difficult, uh, exceedingly stressful, and he was on the edge of burnout for quite a while. So this was uh, a lot of the work that he and I were doing in some of our early years. When he transitioned to a government job that where expectations were much more clear, things really improved for him in mm -hmm. terms of his job stress. Yeah, so moving on, uh, he continued to give me more and more sort of dark material. And if you, you know, if hearing what his early childhood years were like, you, I'm sure you can imagine that there's quite a lot of darkness that he had internalized. Mm -hmm. So um, one day he brought a dream to me. In the dream, he walks into his childhood home and goes into the basement and there he finds Richard's body. Uh, and it's sort of like a movie, like a, um, if you press play and there's this freeze frame of Richard's body having just committed suicide, uh, having uh, sustained a, um, a shotgun blast at close range. And so I'm, I'm gonna spare you the gory details, but essentially his dream was, was extremely disturbing, extremely uh, gruesome. And and it's it's pregnant with, uh, with meaning if you think about uh, if you think about Sigmund Freud's, you know, dream analysis, um, for example, he would say that the, the home generally represents, this is probably an oversimplification, but the, the home represents the self, and here's Richard's dead body, or it's sort of suspended halfway between death and life, suspended in time in the, in the basement of his childhood home, yeah, right. and, uh, and children from the, from the neighborhood collect into the house, and they're trying to come downstairs. So David goes up and tries to shield them from this uh, horrific sight. Mm. So that's the dream. <clears throat> David also shared with me a uh, fantasy. And when I say fantasy, I mean an image that came to him, not necessarily correlated to intent to take action, but my fear was that it would translate into action. Mm. So what I mean by fantasy is simply uh, an imaginary scenario. And in the imaginary scenario, he's committing suicide in front of his family. By this point, he had a wife and a child. And, um, you know, uh, it, it was time for me to start seeking out supervision, <laughs> uh, to put it in a nutshell. The, the, the heaviness and the darkness of the material that he was presenting to me gave me this sort of inchoate kind of fear. And long gone were the days where I it was so comfortable and, and he was so gentle on me yeah. in our early days. And I was starting to feel like I was carrying this heaviness, but really unclear what to do with it or how to help him with it. Because how do you talk somebody out of this? How do you... How, you know, what are the psychotherapeutic te te techniques for dealing with this? You know, mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a reasonably uh, well-trained expert, you know, but I have never read anything like this. Yeah. <laughs> or perhaps it happened upon something like it, but it's like, am I supposed to deal with this? Like me? I can't like hand them off to another subspecialist expert. <laughs> so I, I was sort of stuck with this guy and a bit terrified. Um, and my, and my, um, my supervisors and my, you know, I presented him as a, as a case to some supervisory groups. And um, often people were kind of, I don't know if revulsed is the right word, but at, at least anxious and maybe even a bit questioning of why are you seeing this guy so long term? Like, you mm -hmm. know, if you do CBT with somebody, you're just in and out and you kind of help them and then you move on. But here you are getting entangled in this interminable, you know, it's been many years and it's sort of disturbing. And like, is he going to attack you, Peter? Do you think you're safe? Right. So I was getting this kind of feedback from supervision and wasn't feeling that that was extremely helpful. Mm. Um, so anyway, I found myself a little bit alienated from my own social group, from my own peer group, wow. and thrown in with, with David that much more so. But it felt like the stakes were rising, <clears throat> and my um, lack of clarity about what to do 
was becoming uh, more and more acute and uh, worrisome. But it was becoming existential. I mean, what I mean by that is I could read about the theory in textbooks, but what was happening was really just between him and I, and it was very real. So I was needing to be present in the moment and just sort of live, uh, live the best I could and work with him. Mm -hmm. One really helpful thing, though, that did come from my supervisory experiences was the diagnostic impression that this might be schizoid personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Not a well-known topic, so perhaps I'll just explain it a little bit. But the root word of schizoid, it, re it resembles schizophrenia. What those two conditions have in common is the conception of a schism. Yeah. It's um, so a separation. And this actually fits really well because he was so dissociated from his body, so out of touch with reality. And yeah. so out of so he felt so so much exiled from from the social world. Um, I, I didn't fill that part in too much, but he really struggled with with uh, personal relationships and connecting with people in any so anything like an authentic manner. So um, so schizoid personality disorder seemed to really fit the bill. And when I presented this to him, this was this is now a year and a half ago. So after about six or seven years of therapy. Uh, I presented this diagnostic impression to him, and he found it to be a revelation. And uh, when you when you taught about anagoge in in uh, awakening from the meaning crisis, I felt like I had very much saw him engage in an anagogic anagogic ascent as mm -hmm. he learned about schizoid personality disorder from the textbooks. So felt himself reflected in that, developed a sense of inner coherence as that happened, and he was better able to see into reality more clearly or oh. read in more depth and in more detail about what schizoid personality disorder is. And so he's suddenly engaged in this pretty significant, I want to say, though um, temporary uh, improvement. But there was like this flash of like improvement. Oh, oh really? Yeah, 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 he really seemed to, um, uh, things seemed to get a lot better really quickly. And he described it as a truth bell. So this is a term that I think is uh, uh, really, really uh, helpful. For David, what a truth bell is, is a sense of resonance that rises up from within the body, like a bell ringing, resonating. And why truth? Because he gets the impression that what's going on or what he's learned or what he's in touch with is real or true. Um, but, you know, he's always lived in such a way that his thoughts were very much um, internal and reality was very much external. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he'd sort of like see himself almost like a marionette and his mind could like pull the strings and force his body into action, or if he'd learn information, he'd kind of assess whether it correlates to his, uh, you know, framework of understanding. And so he'd have the sort of correspondence, mm -hmm. epistemology, if you will. But this felt like this was the beginning of a contact epistemology. For right, him, right. Where he um, could touch reality and, re and he could feel reality resonating up through him. And it was self-evidently true because of the bodily experience that mm -hmm. credentialed it. Right. Not like a rational judgment. Right, right. You're, you're reacting to that. Yeah. Well, I'm. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh... It's good, eh? <clears throat> well, yeah. I mean, it. It's. Um, it gives real content to the proposal of anagoge, right? And how it can yeah. really uh, potentially transform people. So please continue. Good. Well, I, I'm getting towards the end of part one. Um, so that's a, that's a, some background on David and, and some of our early years of work together. And in part two, uh, we, we end up having a pretty significant conflict and resolution, uh, reconciliation, um, where I hope that you and I might interact a little bit more here because things start getting a little bit more uh, complex and interesting, I think. But, uh, okay. So on to part two, um, David started explaining to me that he's really struggling with his daughter, mm. Gabby. And he said, you know, I don't know if I've explained to you enough how much rage I have towards her. Oh. And I was, uh, suddenly uh, getting a little nervous, you know, he had my attention. But he's like, you know, sometimes I feel myself dissociated, watching myself take action, uh, but in a disembodied kind of way, uh, as if I have no control over myself. Oh. Uh, and I said, well, you better tell me a little more. So the example he gave me, I won't get into detail because I'm reluctant to kind of get into a discussion about uh, um, what constitutes har harm or, or where's the threshold where risk of harm to a child um, 
means that I, as a professional, am obligated to sort of trigger, uh, you know, a report to Child and Family Services. Right. Uh, but this was very suddenly the horns of the dilemma that I found myself skewered upon. Oh. Um, which was a ter terrifying moment. Yes. But, you know, at first I wanted to say, ah, oh, you know, I know David's a good father. I know he's trying hard. Uh, I've known him for six years. Um, you know, I'm continuing to engage in psychotherapy and sort of downplaying this. That's probably the way to go because, you know, there's a positive ripple effect. When you see person in psychotherapy, their relationships improve. They're better able to be loving and caring for others around them. So there was a part of me that just wanted to be faithful that what we're doing is the good, is the right stuff. Let's not get into this too much. Right, right. But you know, but I, but I, but I, I had a dilemma because, as a, um, because I'm, I'm, uh, you know, registered with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Manitoba. Uh, I, um, there's certain professional expectations and, uh, in fact, duties that um, that constrain me. So, um, so, so I gathered a little bit more information because we need to find out if there's harm coming to the child. Mm -hmm. But essentially, without getting to the detail, uh, he illustrated that there there might be, and I'll just sort of oh. leave it at that vaguely. Yeah. Um, but I was left quite um, concerned, and I had a lot of questions. Um, but I also felt like I was a little bit out of my specialty area because I work as a general adult psychiatrist, so I don't actually deal with too many scenarios where children are involved and mm. dealing with CFS is part of the work. So I called a colleague. And my colleague honed in on this term harm. He said, what's that? You think that there may be harm? Well, why don't you just tell you what, Peter, why don't you just call CFS? You know, what they'll probably do is they'll come in, they'll do an um, assessment. Uh, you're, you're probably a bit too biased to uh, really know what's going on. Uh, so is David. So this objective third party will come in. Everything's probably going to check out okay. And they're probably just going to put in place some parenting supports. And that's probably exactly what David needs. And, you know, John, it just sounded so uh, tempting and it sounded yeah. so reasonable. Yeah. And I'm like, I'll just, call. I'll just call them. Yeah, yeah. I'll just call them. Um, but, you know, what, what happened next maybe differentiates me from what many of my colleagues might have done. Um, because instead of just calling, I called David and I got on a Zoom call with David. And I said, you know, based on the information you gave me, I think I should call yeah. CSS. And he said, well, doc, you've ruined my life. Oh. Uh, I know all about CFS and I know that what you've just done is going to ruin my daughter's life and it's going to ruin my life. So, you know, thanks a lot. So he hangs up um, uh, suddenly and he's never been angry at me before. So like this was, yeah. this was a cal calamitous development for our relationship. And I was, I was a little scared. I don't know exactly what I was scared of because I certainly wasn't the one vulnerable here. But like my heart rate was up and I'm like, oh man, this is uncomfortable. What's going on? I'm doing a lot of talking here, but I hope to. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> well, <clears throat> somehow um, he agreed to continue to do sessions, but he was understandably extremely angry, extremely yeah. threatened and extremely upset that I would even suggest that I would call CFS. And he challenged me at first. He was saying, you know, what do you know about CFS? He's like, I, I received days and days of training in this stuff. And I worked with this stuff in depth and at length. And like, what do you know about CFS? And I said, oh, and I was just sort of honest and vulnerable with him. I'm like, uh, you know, I attended a few lectures about it. And I don't recall too clearly. So truth be told, I called a colleague. He's like, oh, you talked to a colleague, eh? <laughs> He's like, when I've reported people to CFS, uh, I've done so after extremely detailed questioning and, you know, um, you know, yeah. clarifying what the situation is. Um, so he was essentially accusing me of, you know, poor quality work or, um, you know, being impulsive. Um, and um, like our, the, the nature of our relationship has shifted seriously. You know, I was like, wow, uh, I, we used to be really connected and things were really, you know, that, that moment of anagoge, you know, it was mere months prior to uh, to this moment. I was thinking nostalgically back to those days. Right. And I was thinking to myself, what what kind of mess have I gotten myself into now? And what how are we going to get out of this? Because here I am feeling the need to call CFS, but I've kind of asked for his permission, which was an awkward thing to do. Uh, but then there's what I would generally say is the case for me, which is that I've got a deep faith that um, engaging in psychotherapy in this sort of human, existential, kind of open way 
is ultimately probably in his best interest and in his daughter's best interest. So mm. like, what have I done? If I do call CFS at this point, I thought to myself, I will sever the relationship, you know, completely uh, in a way that cannot be recovered. Um, so, but I wasn't, I didn't want to be too quick to kind of decide, oh no, this rule doesn't apply to me. Right. You know, in fact, I had a colleague who recommended I call. It's like, if I choose, if I decide that I'm above the law in this case, what does that make me? You know? Yeah. So I, I had to be like really thoughtful about this. Um, yeah. So this was really tricky. And um, I have a spiritual practice that I engage in in the mornings. Uh, it tends to inv involve yoga or meditation. But around this time, I started taking up prayer, uh, which is something that I've not been super comfortable with in the past. I, I don't tend to enjoy um, petitioning, you know, a, a divinity for favors. Help me, you know, help me with this, help me with that. Um, but for whatever reason, you know, the, the Lord make me an instrument of your peace. That prayer came to me and I found it really powerful to recite that prayer and to, to uh, mm -hmm. sort of ground myself in it around this time. And the last few lines of that prayer involve, uh, they go, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Somehow those lines really grabbed me. Mm -hmm. um, I found there to be something really powerful about that. And I realized as I was reflecting that uh, I needed to actually forgive David. And I think he needed to forgive me too. And I think it yeah. needed to be a bi-directional simultaneous thing because why did I need to forgive him? Because because I, I was scared of him because he was angry at me because I was doing my best. And I thought that I was sort of staying within my lanes and following my procedure as best I could while remaining attuned to him. I was doing the best I could, but here he was giving me so much flack and pushing me away and making me feel really insecure in my professional identity and, you know, doubt my, doubt my, uh, in my intentions. So I felt like I actually needed to kind of put down my defensiveness and forgive him in order to continue to work with him at this point. And certainly he needed to forgive me because he basically saw me as Richard. He basically saw me as Richard, I think. Yeah. Yeah. As about to kill him, as about to kill his family. Like I was right. on the on the cusp of just executing him. That's really how he saw it. Um he saw me as the superintendent. I said, it's out the the situation yeah. is out of my hands. Uh, he, he's been exposed to this situation way too much throughout his life. And he had like an allergic reaction to this sort of power, this sort of any, any sense of like a top down unilateral action that was put on him or like an interpersonal like expectation that I, this is what's going to happen to you. He would have like an allergic reaction to that based on his past experiences. Yeah, yeah, of course. So this was really interesting because um, what it enabled us to start to do as we miraculously continued our sessions and continued to reflect, um, it enabled us to, to, to sort of parse out between who I am as a person in my wholeness, if you will, versus my psychiatric role, which maybe we can call that a fragment of my identity. Mm -hmm. But we were able to actually very clearly dis distinguish between those two. And, um, you know, when I was having some confusion about my role, it was because I wasn't sure where where is my, where's the center of my being? Is it in my psychiatric role or is it in my personal human connection with this man? Mm. Um, right. And so I'd have sort of this confusion about where my allegiances lie, if you will. Right. right. And uh, thankfully he and I were able to, to get into a lot of depth about this. Um, he actually asked me to teach him how to forgive. And again, this was, uh, um, this was spurred on by his, uh, by his wife, Gloria, who initially encouraged him to seek therapy in the first place. Uh, but here she was encouraging him now to continue to maintain this relationship with this therapist that he's been in a relationship with for seven years. Don't just drop it. And uh, learning to forgive could be a really important, uh, really helpful yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, uh, uh, really good on David to continue to expose himself to this uh, very challenging time where he was very much threatened by me, but allowing not not just not allowing himself to just face that fear, but to even express anger towards me. So I it was a part of me that was really proud of him. It's like, you've never been able to do this for years. Like, good for you. You're standing up to me. You know, part of me was like really proud of him while at the same time I was empowering and fear a little bit and kind of, right, right. Uh, you know, feeling anxious about how I was, uh, how I was doing. But it was an interesting moment because um, 
again, this differentiates me from what I think many of my colleagues would do because I was kind of looking up to him at some point. I was like, he has the ability to forgive me. Like he has the power in some way in that respect, hey? And usually when we think about the medical model, we think of an active doctor, a passive patient, and right. the treatment kind of ushers downhill towards the patient. So it's strange that the patient had the, had the upper hand. Of course, we're moving more into um, an era where there's more patient-centered care, but I hear a lot of lip service about that, and I don't actually see that taking place very much. Right. Um, so I think this was, um, uh, yeah, this was me really trying to, to treat him as a human, and I felt that we were leaving the roles of doctor and patient behind, and we were getting more into an existential mode of therapy, or it's even kind of wrong to call it therapy at this point. This was him and I continuing in the structure that had been set up through the system, through our therapy, but we were, but I felt like we were inhabiting it uh, or seeking to inhabit this space in more of a whole or human manner. Right. Do you have any thoughts or, or questions here? No, I just, I want, I'm wondering, um, yeah, I, I'm wondering what's happening between the two of you. Like, what's the nature of the discourse between you then? Like, um, it's shifting off of therapy into something else. Like, is it becoming more yeah. like, properly dialogical? Like, what what's going on in the in, in in the interaction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Let me tell you a bit more about how he was seeing me at this time and some of the feedback he was giving me. So, um, so he was he was saying that he was looking to uh, to work on forgiveness. And um, yeah, but he was afraid because he said that in the past, it's been too common, all too common for him to be told what to do or what role to adopt. Yeah, and yeah. therefore he'd become the slave and the other would become the master. Yeah, talking with his wife, Gloria, uh, she had criticized him for too often, uh, just forgiving and forgetting, uh, just being really way too quick to give people grace. Um, but in my case, he was asking me, I thought in a very mature manner, he's like, you know, there's a part of me that wants to forgive you, but um, I know that if I did that, it would be my usual way of forgiving. Right. And it would be facile, you know? Yeah. It would be just too much, like, forgive and forget, like, nothing happened. Right. And there's another part of me, he was able to uh, insightfully say, that it is not about to forgive you whatsoever. That's quite angry at you and still is, is interested in maybe getting up and just walking out and not continuing this therapy at all. Um. So, so here he was expressing his anger and, in fact, reflecting about it. Um, and he was asking me to forgive him. And I, I realized that this was such a strange situation for me to be in because I'm simultaneously the one who caused him the harm or I was about to cause him harm. Uh, but at the same time, he's asking me to forgive him. It's like, th this must be like, you know, Dante's Inferno, where the, the, this, the spoiler at the end of uh, the Inferno part of, of, of the Divine Comedy is that uh, Virgil and Dante get out of hell by traversing the body of the devil himself. Mm -hmm. And I felt very much like David was, was doing that, that he was actually going right into the heart of darkness, coming right to the person who was on the cusp of hurting him and asking you, please teach me how to forgive you. And I realized what a, what a strange position that I, that I find myself yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was trying to share with him about that. I was trying to self-disclose and I was saying, for example, you know, I don't think it's up to me to tell you to forgive me. And in fact, if I told you to forgive, then that would we'd be playing into some of your old dynamics. Mm -hmm. So I think that I am worthy of forgiveness, or I hope that I am. Uh, but ultimately, it's up to you. And all I can do is just show you that I'm still here. I'm still willing to talk things through. And, um, it, you know, but I, but I, I realized that at this point, I hadn't yet told him that I'm not going to call CFS. I think there was still a part of me that was hanging on to that yeah. card. Um, and, and I thought to myself, boy, um, should I should I tell him that I won't call? Because I don't know that I want to promise that. If there's additional information that's revealed, maybe <laughs> at some point I will need to, right? So I didn't want to reassure him, don't worry, I'm not going to do that. But how do I ask, how do I teach him about forgiveness if I if I don't tell him that it's going to be okay? And again, I, I realized that I think I needed to lead with forgiveness. I needed to 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 really just um sink into vulnerability with him. Mm -hmm. Um I just want to think for a moment about where to, where to go next, just in the interest of time. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, forgiveness. It was really tricky. Uh, so as I was saying, I was uh, doing praying in the morning and uh, doing meditation and uh, really uh, digging deep and trying to figure out how do I, how do I lead him uh, while being the one who caused him so much trouble? Well, eventually we got to a point where um, 
I started to realize that the psychiatrist and Peter were these two different parts that he was seeing. The psychiatrist is the one who's unforgivable and Peter is the one who can be maybe too easily forgiven. And I realized that I was actually seeing myself more clearly, but through his eyes, empathically through his eyes. Mm -hmm. And I think that simultaneously he was seeing himself more clearly through my eyes. Right, right. Like in other words, he was able to see that despite the fact he's putting his needs on me and causing me trouble and expressing anger towards me, I'm still there with him. So there's something called care that might involve tolerating a person even when they're giving you trouble. Mm -hmm. so this was this was the beginning of him and I sort of simultaneously kind of interacting, but in a way where I could see myself through him and he could see himself through me. And I feel like something dialogical was starting to happen here because we were getting somewhere that neither of us could have gotten to on our own. Sounds like it, yes. Um, and in fact, I did a lot of reflecting about what is this medical system that I'm a part of that is so full of principles and, and um, rules and uh, you know, algorithms. And if I get this information, then I'm triggered to sort of do this action. And this top-down unilateral action can, can usher forth through me as a, as a cog in a machine. And I suddenly, he helped me really reflect that it's like, boy, I'm really part of this big machine that can be very decontextualizing. By that, what I mean is, man, doesn't seven years matter? Like, doesn't seven years of therapy with this guy tell you something? And isn't it possible that there's some circumstances where a blanket policy ought not apply? Of course. So I, really like that. I think so. So, and, and this might feel a bit controversial or scandalous to, to say this in the, in the fate, if I'm talking to the college or if I'm talking to my various, you know, licensing bodies, like you don't talk this way to your superiors. But, but this is what I think is powerful about the story. I realized that my priority is to him and, uh, and to his daughter, of course but to the well-being of the person, not to just following the rules. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of trouble has, has happened in the past when people blindly follow the rules uh, without reflecting about, you know, what, what is the outcome that's popping out right. of the end of my action. Yeah. So he could see that. Um, but, you know, there was a while, though, where he was realizing that we were just too intellectualized. We were talking about forgiveness in a little bit too much of a content-focused manner. And one day he just sort of hit me a little bit more personally, and he said, you know, I think I need you to feel bad. And I was taken aback and I said, uh, you know, let, let me reflect on that one for, for a bit. But, you know, I, I can I can tell you what I think the structure of forgiveness might be or the importance of uh, how forgiveness is something that happens rather than, than action. I can talk about the, the hierarchy of, you know, there's forgiveness or neither forgiving nor forgetting. Then there's forgiving and forgetting. But then, like, you know, we can talk about forgiveness, but not forgetting. So there's like a kind of a structure that I yeah. that I could talk about. But ultimately, he wanted to kind of get past all the intellectualization. And he said, Doc, I think I just need you to feel bad. And I, I was kind of, again, thrilled by his insightfulness, but also a little bit worried about it because, uh, you know, it's pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> anyway, I found myself doing an imaginal exercise. Mm. One day I was at the cabin, I'm blessed to have a cabin that I have access to with my in-laws. And my mother-in-law picked up my child. I have a two-year-old. And she walked through the cabin with him and walked out the door. And I watched as his head was bobbing up and down through the screen door. And I was imagining that this was CFS apprehending my child. Mm. I was imagining my child being walked out of my life. And um, you know, it's, it's, it, it kind of brings up an emotion even as I think about it or as I bring it up here. Um, but like this was me uh, like putting myself in, I think in, in, in David's shoes and really letting myself experience from a pers uh, perspectively yes. what the threat is, what it really means for a child to be taken out of your life. And are they going to know me? What's going to happen to them? Are they going to grow up okay? And it, it, it breaks my heart to think about how often, you know, uh, people's family structures are disrupted and, and children have lives that are, that are not as, um, you know, the quality that I'm able to offer my children. So I, so I had that experience and, and uh, I brought this back to David and I said to him, hey, this is what I went through. Uh, and in fact, as I was telling him about this experience, a, a bit of a tear was welling up in my eye and he saw it and he said, there, that's it. That's what I needed. And he said, thank you very much. He said, that's exactly what I needed. So I think in that moment, um, like forgiveness was seated in his heart. And I think that he could see that perhaps I was forgivable. Um, prior to that moment, I had told him, you know, you decide whether I'm forgivable or not. Forgiveness is not something that I'm going to tell you to do. But because in that moment, I think what he realized was that intuitively, spontaneously within him, it was revealed to him that perhaps I can be forgiven.
Mm. And what does it mean for him to forgive me? Here, here's the feedback that he gave me. Prior to that, he had seen me categorically, like he had sort of seen me as either the psychiatrist who was not forgivable whatsoever, or like a fragment or something like that. But here, he suddenly saw that I'm a whole human. He suddenly saw that he could wow. relate to me in this this <clears throat> more open way, um, with without without me being kind of associated with a simple feeling of uh, approach or avoid without me having uh, without having a whole host of expectations that are attached to how I'm coming across to him. He suddenly, I think, was able to see me as a whole human, which means that um, there was an openness. There was the possibility of spontaneity. There was the possibility for us to, to, to navigate and do things in a customized way, in a, in a way where care means that I'm attuned to you, not that that I'm using my knowledge of you to control you or to or, or right. to plan right. to cause you harm. So that's that's sort of um, we're getting to the end here. Um, I mean, the last part of the story, just to put the cherry on top, is he watched the video of you and I talking about uh, um, uh, another case. And uh, when he watched that video, he was bowled over. So he was actually literally in his kitchen fixing himself a sandwich or something, and he literally fell to the floor. And it hit him like a pile of bricks. He's like, oh, my gosh, Dr. Chaplinsky is a person who is caring and invested in his patients. And that's available to me. And I've been rejecting it up till this, up till now. Mm. So it was at that moment that he realized that, you know, forgiveness is possible. And I, I think forgiveness really hit him, like literally. Mm. <laughs> um, later, uh, and this is the final piece of my presentation to you today. But later I was telling him, you know, David, uh, it feels like we had been through quite a conflict and, and we've really worked our way through a powerful reconciliatory process. Uh, and I have to admit that like, it's been a pleasure and an honor to, 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 uh, to work with you through all of this. Uh, but I also have to admit that there's been times where my ego perhaps, or you know, the role that I was tempted to play got in the way of, of our work. And that literally may have caused you harm. And his feedback to me was doc, don't worry about it. Uh, don't be too hard on your ego. I need that too. I need the whole of you ego and all. Mm. So that was a moment where I felt like he, he granted me such, such a beautiful, I, I don't know what to call it, grace or forgiveness, but uh, the connection between him and I at that moment felt like it transcended the, the, like the simple definition of doctor patient relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like I learned a lot about my moral integrity, but where there's play, there's ways where the system kind of constrains me to take action and I'm willing to abdicate my responsibility or turn a blind eye to what the outcome might be, but he helped me reflect about that, gathering my moral integrity, I think. And um, the final thing I'll say is that his mental health improved substantially after this. He felt never more like himself. He still struggles socially, but he has more plans to in interact more with people socially. He has plans to rise the ranks of his job and to become more productive that way. His relationship with his daughter is extremely connected and powerful at this point. Uh, I didn't talk much about his relationship with his wife or their, their sexual problems, but there were significant problems there, and that's improved uh, immeasurably. So again, it feels like we're now again in another um, anagogic process, yeah, yeah. both of us, yeah. both of us in an interconnected way. Yeah. And I feel like what's happened for him is this really robust healing experience that is intrinsically connected with my wholeness experience. Mm -hmm. and, and the interweaving of the two for me is where, where the action is. The simultaneity of those two is uh, what I think uh, is, that's what I think I mean when I want to say that dialogos can be healing. Mm, mm, for sure. Oh, wow, that was, that was really wonderful. Yeah, I, I'm so I'm, uh, well, first a couple sort of uh, question, requests for explication. When, when David was recognizing you as a whole being, what was going on reciprocally in him? I think that his schism was closing up. Yeah, yeah, that's like, what I I'm think. Sensing. Yeah, because I think he would adopt part object relations without getting into it in too much detail. Mm -hmm. I think there was like a part of him that would see me as a part, and there'd be a, a, a simple feeling of yeah. affect valence that would unite us. So if I'm a good guy, then he, I'm forgivable, and he and he's just this forgiving kind of pathetic creature. <clears throat> yeah. But if I'm bad, then I'm not forgivable, and he's this angry kind of like he's this monster. Right. And so he would fragment just uh, alongside the way that he would see the fault lines fragment within me. Right. So as he saw my wholeness gather, then I think he also developed 
greater integrity within himself simultaneously. Yeah, that's what I that's what that's what my sense was. So I see that, you know, um yeah, there's a differentiation process. You sort of and then he allows you to integrate, complexify, in fact, in some way, and that that allows him to also. I mean, so he these things get first of all differentiated, so they're not confounded, and then they get reintegrated in a clear way, and then the two of you were were sort of resonating that. And so it's interesting. He has sort, he has sort of a preliminary anagoge about himself, but with sort of just the with the abstract knowledge, and then that sort of I think sounds like it sort of primes him, um, and of course there was. There needed to be an event that moved it um, into in interpersonal as opposed to uh, just sort of, um, I don't know what to call it, cognitive anagoge with the world or something like that or with himself. Yeah. Can I, can I suggest anagoge with himself and the world, but then between what happened between him and I, it might have been something like agape. I don't know yes, if that's- I was going to say it. That. Yeah, um, I think, but yeah, I think an ag agopic relationship developed between him and I, love, again, a taboo word, but I feel like I was interested in how am I relevant to him? And he, yeah. I think, was realizing how I am relevant to him, uh, how he can be relevant to me. Yes, exactly. I think um, that's great. And that's what I wanted to, I mean, I'm glad you said that because it, it shifts into this interpersonal anagoge, but the anagoge is agopic and it's healing yeah. and it's person making. And you both get caught up in that. You become... Uh, I mean, if a, if a person is an integrated moral agent, you're becoming more of a person. I don't mean any insult there, oh, right? No. And but in the same thing for him, he's also like you're 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 doing you're doing this. And I was also intrigued about how you know this imaginal thing you did actually helps afford you uh, getting that resonance going and starting to establish that preliminary affinity. There's a lot uh, yeah. to be learned. Um, so I mean. Uh my first response is I just see a I, I mean I hope it's not just projected but you reached out to me too I see a uh -huh. lot of the stuff about anagoge the imaginal and agape at work in this process I'm wondering what's happening also with you when you were praying is this an imaginal thing for you or do um did, was that opening up and becoming dialogical like what was going on there in the prayer and um how, did it was there any sense that the praying afforded you getting into this relationship with David Oh yeah, no question. That that's a great question. Um, because I saw that what I was doing was self-sacrificial in a way. Uh, again, I think a lot of my professional kind of um, leanings would get me to stay in the power position and not not allow any vulnerability to be present. But what this prayer I think is so helpful in 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 establishing is that there's a deeper power than just grabbing power. You can tap into a deeper power if you lead with forgiveness. That makes you forgivable. Right. And the last line is it is in dying that you were born to eternal life. So what I what that helped me give me the courage to do was to expose myself to him in a vulnerable way where where it's like, you know what, I screwed up. Like I made a mistake. I went too far. I'm sorry. You know, um, I was tempted to do something that could have caused you harm. And I and I deeply apologize for that. You don't hear doctors saying that kind of thing too much. I'm not trying to throw my profession under the bus, but um, I, I do think that, in fact, some of the colleagues that I presented this case to have wondered if I'm too self-effacing, if I've been a little bit just throwing myself, throwing myself under the bus. But this prayer, I think, helped me do so in a balanced manner mm -hmm. where I was able to engage in self-sacrificial love, not just by, you know, going out mindlessly immolating myself in a field, mm -hmm. <laughs> but in a productive way where I put my ego and my role as a psychiatrist in service of his betterment. So therefore, like lowering, lowering my status to a position and ordering it properly, I think, to help uh, in service of his healing. Whereas there was the risk that my role as a psychiatrist, because it, there tends to be a lot of power at play in that, could have literally caused him an iatrogenic event, you know, the allergic reaction where he'd react against yeah. power. So sorry, that's a little bit wordy, but I think no, that no, no, but I, helped let me, me ground into that. I, 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 let, me, let me try in my own words and see if I'm getting it. Um... There's a sense in which what the prayer is doing imaginally is it's putting you like it's putting you perspectively present to a power greater than you, uh, and in this in sense you talked about vulnerability, but it's, it's it sounds more like humility to me. There's a humility that comes in and a recognition of uh, uh, of something greater than yourself needs to be at work in this situation, and so uh, you reorient that way because of that, and then that um, yes. that opens you up to possibilities that were otherwise on. Un unavailable to you is that is that a good way of putting it absolutely 
grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. Grounding myself in this prayer really just offered me a lot of resource to give. Yes. Uh, but but like, I think that's, that is humility, but it's not like, oh, I'm so humble. It's no, like no, 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 no. That's not what humility is. enacting humility, right? Yeah. Humility is a proper proportioning to, uh, uh, to reality. Um, so uh, do you still carry that s sense of that? Not, a, not as an idea, but a sense of presence of that larger, um, I don't know what metaphor you use that, but the greater power, uh, do you still, that you still feel tethered to that? Um, um, is it still present in you or was it only in this case or is it, is it percolated out into your life in general? Uh, the previous case I presented to you, John, launched me on an adventure where it's like, oh my gosh, I can tap into this greater power to do yeah, yes. in, in my mental health work. Oh. My, the case I presented with you today with David feels like it steps along that journey. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I feel like I'm deepening into this. And like, you know, my meditation practice, I'm falling off the wagon and getting back on. And yeah. I'm a father of two children and I've got a third yeah. on the way. So it's like getting up in the morning and and it's hard to drink enough coffee to uh, make that meditation happen on a regular basis. And with prayer, I'm, I'm kind of on and off. But like, I would say that in general, I would say that I'm re quite devoted. And if I do fall off the wagon, I get back on it. So in general, um, I want to say that I am deepening it more and more into this sense. And it's hard to put it into words exactly what it is. Yeah. But, uh, you know, as, as um, uh, you know, my, I'm raised Catholic and I, and I have significant Christian kind of leanings. It's in my bones. So it's easy for me to say that my relationship with God, uh, put it in those words, uh, is, is deepening um, over time. Uh, but you know, I really appreciate uh, Eastern spirituality, yoga. I, I have it. Yeah, I'm not um, trying to pin you to anything. That's not that's not my concern. My concern is I want to understand the what's happening. You know, your phenomenology, your cognition, what's going on for you, and I understand what you mean when you say it's in your bones. And so that's the language that's indispensable for you to yeah. sort of articulate and keep this in mind for yourself. I get that. Yeah. Keep yeah. it apart. But uh, yeah. but I, I, I'm just wondering because it sounds to me. Um, that there's a ritual element entering into the therapy. therapy. Um, so a ritual is a practice that yeah. goes broadly and deeply, right, into your life oh, yeah. and levels of your psyche. And it sounds like th there's certain cases where it's taking on this ritual component. Yeah. Let me talk about yoga for a sec, because I think that's been very helpful too. In yoga, I see this resonance between focal awareness and allowing um, a, a single instruction to... to, to uh, like a hologram, per, like extend its way throughout the yeah. entire practice. Yeah, so yeah, a teacher yeah. has told me, for example, when you inhale or when you exhale, ex express your the, your big toe into the ground. But when I when I'm putting my focus there, I'm also aware of my arm stretched into opposite direction. Yeah, and I'm noticing at the same time this attention here and this distance and pulling there. And yeah. so in the yoga practice, I'm constantly kind of allowing myself to. Ex exist between these extremes and yeah. full, feel the pull yeah. in opposite ways, but maintaining attunement on the breath. So this is how I, I feel like that ritualistic element helps me maintain attunement on David. Yes. And here's all this like distraction and all these pulls and pushes and discomfort and pain and alarm. But it's like how, but the maintaining the attunement and 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 being devoutly focused on, like it like. It's like prayer, actually, doing therapy, I think. Yes, I'm yes. maintaining my priority on this guy. And wow, is it, can you imagine that the mental health system itself can interfere with that? So it's like that was a very tough distraction to, to yeah. keep out of the way and to maintain my attunement to him. And I'd say that ritual has really helped me um, yeah, yeah. Sort of maintain that as a devotion. Right. I, I can see that. That's powerful. That's very powerful. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. It's an embodied, imaginal thing that then is transferring in this in these powerful ways for you. That's very powerful. Um, well, so we're we're almost out of time. But yeah. what do you, what do you think? What do you think would need to happen to allow <laughs> psychiatry, or at least the psychotherapeutic dimension of psychiatry, uh, to properly appreciate and proportionally appropriate this into it into itself? That's a huge question, and I have no idea how to answer it thoroughly. But um, I was losing some sleep last night in anticipation of this conversation. And can I share with you what came to me in the middle of the night? Yes, please. Again, I watched episode 10 A and B, where you did that amazing um, 
example of uh, di dialectic into dialogos with the proposer, the listener, the herald, yeah. the scribe, and the herald. Yeah, we've changed the name to the herald to the vibe, the scribe and the vibe. Uh, the scribe so. and the vibe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just let me offer this. Uh, I, I imagined, I imagined that dialectic into dialogos be carried out along the theme of what is the mental health system designed to do virtuously in the best sense? What is it there for? What is the virtue that the mental health system is supposed to do? Right. But then there's a fifth role, and the fifth role is the iconoclast. Right, right, right. And I've been reading Ivan Illich recently. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but but he he was an iconoclast who was who was a Catholic priest, but very critical or very cautious about how the corruption of the best is the worst. So he saw that Christianity, which he was uh, committed to, cast a shadow, and and there was a great evil that is possible when a great good is is brought into yeah. the world. Yes. So the iconoclast would be the fifth role where there's a reflection that's done of here's the best that the mental health system can offer and, and we can educe that out of each other. But the iconoclast will point out what is the nature of an institutionalized bureaucratized system and how is how does it for, forbid uh, certain virtues from expressing themselves? Right, right, right. I just think that more attention needs to be paid to that about how the, the nature of a big system can actually bracket out the humanity of the humans involved. Yes. When there's too many algorithms, too many rules, too many regulations, too much bureaucracy. This is a huge problem. Everyone's getting choked out by bureaucracy and everybody hates it. I don't know who, who's enjoying themselves these days, but nobody seems to know how to stem the tide. But what we need is more room for the humans. The psych What is psychiatry? Greg Henriquez goes on about this. So there's a there's a conceptual corruption in the in the field of psychology. No one knows what psychology is. Yes. No one knows what psychiatry is. Do we know what the psyche is? This thing that we supposedly are doing medicine on and trying to heal. We need to. I feel like we need to bring something like a fellowship or a dialectic into dialogos into the heart of the structure of psychiatry. And that's my grandiose vision that pops into my mind at three a.m. <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 I thank you for sharing that. I, I think. Uh, the way things are ramping up in our society negatively um, and the threats. Um, um, I think, uh, I don't think that's too grand of a vision. We, I, we very much, I, would, I just recorded a video with uh, with Guy Sandstock, Christopher Mastiff, Pietro, and Corinna and uh, about the, the Circling into Dialogos workshops um, and um, the, the vision about if, if we can get this kind of stuff into like education and government and bureaucracies that are supposed to be in the service of human beings. Um, yes, in one sense, it's grandiose, but in another sense, it's there's no viable alternative. And so uh, we, I think we need to uh, really try to not impose, but no. to really try to um, propose and get people to appreciate uh, the need for this in a way so that they willingly adopt it. Um, I think well, that that's that's the answer. And I did a dialectic into dialogos workshop at the beginning of February with you and the group and a big plug to everybody listening. Like it was fantastic. Can't say, can't speak highly enough about it. Really loved it. Um, and um, I don't think it would be like, here's what I would say. I think we're in a famine. There's a wisdom famine, as you, you say, and this thing can really catch. And I think that's all we can rely on. It's it's the it's the uh, uh, it's it's uh, uh, the hermeneutic of beauty. You know, yeah, if this yeah. shines out like a truth bell for people, they'll just know it'll be oh, credentialed. I love that. Yeah, it'll yeah, be really credentialed cool. by their own resonance. Like this is what I need. This is beautiful. This is wonderful. And when people see that, like it's just going to spread uh, um, in a way that you can't even control or that you can't take credit for even. Uh, but it's good, and people will see that. And it's my intention to help you spread that as much as I can. So I, I feel like that's a big part of what, what brought me here. Uh, I'm trying to encourage you in your work because I'm so, I'm so thankful for it. And I'm also yeah. really pleased to benefit from it. And I hope to help uh, in any way I can. Thank you, Peter. I think that's a really good place to end our time together. Fantastic.